feel so bad for all of you that can't see my amazing shoes. <laughs> They're uh, very colorful. <laughs> uh, thank you so much to the Missouri Review. I'm so honored to be honored by you tonight and all the lovely people I've met here. And I'm so honored also to be in the company of Philip and Janice. Really such a pleasure to get to know you both and to read your work in this context, and, or any context. Um, great either way. Now uh, let me just find it. I'm keeping my bookmark as my own photo booth. <laughs> a little narcissism. Uh, okay. So I'll just read sort of uh, from the beginning of the story, which is for those of you who want to follow along on page 93. This is very loud. Philip is right. <laughs> After my brother Jonah's funeral, I didn't fly home with my parents. Instead, I stayed behind with Ava in her shoebox apartment in Tel Aviv and spent a couple nights learning to go down on her, an act that felt surprisingly natural once I got used to the right-up closeness of it. I'd never been with another woman before, but we didn't talk about that. Mostly, we were quiet or talked about Jonah. Though Ava and I had met for the first time at his funeral, she'd been serving with him for over a year and he'd shown me many pictures of the two of them in their sand green IDF uniforms, their arms slung around one another's shoulders in the casual way of soldiers everywhere. In emails, he'd referred to her breezily as my best bud, but when he'd come home on leave the last time, he'd gotten uncharacteristically wasted on a 12-pack of high life and said to me, I can't stand it, Mary. I want her so badly, I can't pray, I can't sleep. I'm on my knees asking God to either turn her straight or gun her down so I don't have to look at her anymore. And then I spend all night begging forgiveness for thinking such fucked up shit. Before Ava, I had never seen my 23-year-old brother in love, or even in lust, which I had pop-psychologized as a reaction to the trauma of his puberty. He dreaded its coming for years even before the physical changes began. He was terrified of losing his voice. And I was frightened too. Just a year and a half older than he, I'd grown up to the sound of his blue sky treble floating around our house, the foresty trill of arpeggios from behind his bedroom door, and I was used to a life organized by his choir practice and performances. He'd been singing since he was four years old and had been gifted in the oldest sense of the word, as if a hand had reached down and pressed light into his throat. We'd both been raised by secular Jews, but Jonah was raised by his choir as well and was a believer. He'd been raised on music steeped in God. The Christian God, I'd argued once, home freshman year of college for winter break. I was sitting at our kitchen table watching him blend peanut butter and bananas into ice cream, as always working tirelessly against his twinky teenage metabolism. All those old songs are about Jesus. It's got nothing to do with words, Jonah said over the screech of the blender. I didn't listen to the words. I listened to the feeling. He was 17 then and had known for several years that his voice was never coming back. He could still sing better than most, but his tone was uneven, his range stilted, all the buttercup richness grappled down. His coach had told our parents there were some boys who never came to terms with the change, never figured out how to handle their new instrument, and gently he recommended that Jonah begin to see a therapist instead to address the mind behind the larynx. But by that time, he was beginning to lift weights and had subbed out choir practice for the temple and the gym, and my parents figured he was moving on. All praise music, all worship music, it's the music that tells you what the song's about, said Jonah, pouring his viscous beige shake into a glass. The lyrics are just a key like on a map, a compass rose, but you don't need the idea of north if you know which way is up. He took a sip of his drink, his corded neck contracting and releasing. This new body of his called attention to itself in a way that frightened me. The popping veins, the hammy arms swinging from bricked shoulders, the pulse beating beneath the stretched tight skin of his temple, all of it a constant unwelcome reminder of human meatiness. Only his face was the same as it had always been. Narrow, alert, a delicacy about his mouth like he was holding a diamond on the tip of his tongue. He'd begun wearing a knitted black kippah and the whole effect the jacked up body, the little Jewish head, was disconcerting. You weren't this religious when you were actually singing though, I said, why now? He sat down across from me. God gave me my voice, he said, and then he took it away. Think about it, Mary, why would he do that? 
Punishment, I said. No, said Jonah, and he'd made a swishing side-to-side motion with his hand, almost like the queen's wave. Redirection. I have a new compass now. I didn't know it at the time, but his compass was already set east towards the Israeli army, and that very spring he made Aliyah to Israel and became a Chael Boded, a lone soldier. At his funeral four years later, I saw the phrase written down in English characters for the first time and realized it wasn't lone as I'd always thought of it, like we were loaning Jonah out and would get him back eventually, but lone like only, like alone. The night after Jonah's funeral, Ava came to my hotel room while my parents were out. It was the first time I'd seen her out of uniform. She was Israeli, but of Russian-American descent, and was as blonde and pale-eyed as an Iowa farm girl, though slight rather than sturdy. Her short curls were wild outside the confines of her green cap, and as a civilian, she was wearing Chuck Taylors and boys' skinny jeans, like a beautiful, clear-skinned version of the skaters I'd had crushes on in junior high. We sat pressed close together on my parents' enormous hotel bed and watched the videos of Jonah that Ava had shot with her phone. She said, I know some people won't want to look so soon, but I brought them just in case. And I said, I want to see anything you have. The videos were small on the phone screen, but the sound was clear and very loud, and the first voice from the speakers was Jonah's. He was speaking Hebrew, a language I'd only heard him use during prayer, never like this in everyday life, sitting on a stone wall in his uniform and chatting to someone just beyond the screen. Ava tried to translate. He says, does anyone have a pen? But I shushed her. I wanted to hear only Jonah. Better, maybe, that I couldn't understand him. The sound of his voice alone had lined my eyes with tears. He was laughing, tan, dusty. Coke commercial happy, the way you want your loved ones to look in memory. A black-nosed machine gun was hanging at his side, loose and casual like I'd carry a purse. And behind him, I could see the turrets of old Jerusalem and the golden gleam of the Dome of the Rock. Another soldier had come into the picture to hand him a pen and a small pink notepad. She was narrow as a dart and moved in flutters. I vaguely recognized her from the funeral, remembered her dark hair sticking to her tear-wet face like a net. That's Noah, Ava whispered, her lips nearly touching my ear. She likes your brother. Look, it's so obvious. Noah was flickering her fingers through the ends of her ponytail, and I saw that she couldn't meet Jonah's eyes when he spoke to her, though she was smiling, close-mouthed and nervous. For a moment, I let myself spin my brother's life out past the frame of the camera. Noah in white, shards of wedding glass beneath their feet, a faux Bauhaus apartment in Tel Aviv, and a yarmulke toddler with a serious brown face and Jonah's lost little eyes. But even had he lived, that life was only fiction. He was looking uncaringly beyond Noah, at the camera, at Ava. I was crying, and Ava took my hand to squeeze it tightly. I felt so heavy, drowning in silty water, Yet at her touch, I felt, too, the lifting of my lungs, a surface-focused surge between my legs, the lightness that comes from desire from wanting something. I thought simultaneously, this feeling means I'll be okay, and this feeling means I'm lost forever. The contradiction made me dizzy. What is he writing, I said, in part to distract myself, on that little pink paper? A prayer, Ava said, for the wall. What do you mean, what wall? The Western Wall, Ava said. Come on, you know this wall. In Jerusalem? What kind of prayer? It's custom, she said, to write a prayer and put it in the wall, in between the stones. If you go and look, you can see all the cracks are filled with paper. What did Jonah pray for? Ava lifted one shoulder and looked down at her hands, still intertwined. He didn't say. You know, it's private. When was this? A week or so ago, a few days before the accident. We were talking over the recording of Jonah, and I felt a pang of guilt for muffling his voice. When he'd been sad, he'd always wanted silence, but I was unlike him in that regard. What I wanted was to hear everything, to know what was running through Jonah's inscrutable head in his last days, whether he knew they were his last days, whether he was happy, miserable, yearning. I wanted to know what he had prayed for at the end. I wanted a window beyond the screen. I wanted that piece of paper. Ava leaned into me, her shoulder warm and strong. While off screen, she laughed, the camera shaking up and down. I leaned back into her and stared at my brother's pixelated hands, now folding up that slip of pink, 
his words disappearing within the pleats. When Ava kissed me a while later, I couldn't tell if I was stealing Jonah's dearest wish or granting it. Thank you.